Good morning, everybody. So I can say that because we don't often have morning events, but it's it was essentially because of your fight, mm -hmm. Finbar. So my name is Barry Colfer. I'm the director of research here at the Institute of International and European Affairs. Absolutely thrilled to have everybody here in house, in person, in full Technicolor at our headquarters in central Dublin. Really, really happy to be joined by Finbar Birmingham. This has been in the oven for a long time, actually. So Finbar, as we know, is a Brussels-based correspondent. I'll give you the, the full bio in a moment, but working for the uh, Hong Kong newspaper, South China Morning Post. But Finbar, we've had a couple of missed connections over the past year and a half, actually, where that's right, it was David O'Sullivan, our previous right. AG, who made the connection. So really, really happy to have you here on the topic of uh, EU-China relations. What What is the future of EU-China relations? So I'm just going to briefly introduce uh, Finbar in a moment, but I'm very happy that this is a slightly different format than what we typically use. So Finbar has dispensed with the opportunity for a stump speech. We're going straight into questions and answers. So we're just going to have a fireside chat. It's, it's a lovely balmy for those online uh, May morning, so there's no need for an actual fire. But we're just going to be getting down to a discussion for a quarter of an hour or so, 20 minutes. And then we'll turn over to you guys here in, pre in, in person in Dublin and indeed the hordes online. So Finbar Birmingham is a Brussels-based correspondent covering Europe's relationship with China. Uh, he's the senior Europe correspondent for the Hong Kong newspaper South China Morning Post, as, as mentioned, and it's a role he's held since 2021. So you've been Brussels-based since that time. And over the last decade, Finbar has reported on China through a number of different lenses. And over seven years in Hong Kong, he chronicles the Chinese trade economy through the Trump years and COVID-19. And since coming to Brussels, he's charted a downward spiral in EU-China ties following Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine. And he regularly appears on broadcast media and has won and been nominated for awards for his reporting and podcasting. And as I said at the outset, he's from Fermanagh. Yeah, and nominated far more awards than I've won. Yeah. I've lost a lot of awards too. Oscar nominated. Award losing journalist is what I, what I should have. An award losing right. journalist. That keeps you hungry, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. But listen, really, really happy to have you here, Finbar. And there's a, a number of themes that I have that I'd like to explore with, with Finbar. I know from casting an eye around the room, there's, a, there's experts in the room. I'm not a China expert, but I, I am something of an EU expert. So my questions will be through that prism. So if anybody wants to interject or add to a question, please just put up your hand. And then after the 15, 20 minute parlay, we'll turn to the audience, as I've said. So I'd like to start, Finbar, with a, uh, I guess, a simple enough question with no doubt invites a long-winded answer potentially, but can you just tell us the current state of EU-China relations? I know, for example, over the period of the pandemic, I think there was a, an almost wholesale withdrawal of Chinese diplomats from Brussels. And just thinking about this, um, this would have affected peer-to-peer -peer relations and I don't know the very nature of Chinese EU diplomatic ties. So with that in mind, kind of coming off the back of the pandemic, can you just tell us what the current state of affairs is between EU and China? Yeah, the short answer is not great. Um, and just on that point of COVID, I think that was when we noticed a marked sort of deterioration, um, you know, uh, combined with the general unrest about the pandemic and sort of origins and so on, we started to see a bit more of a an aggressive stance from, from Chinese diplomats in Europe and elsewhere. This wolf warrior diplomacy didn't sit well. Um, you know, the mask diplomacy and so on is, uh, was, was, was obviously added to a litany of issues that Europe already had with China, be it from the human rights perspective, pre-pandemic, um, you know, there was an awful lot of coverage about the human rights situation in Xinjiang. We saw the crackdown on democracy in Hong Kong, lots of other issues added to that. And then you've got another pillar of stuff um, on the economic side. So you had all of these maelstrom of issues swirling around. Things weren't going great. Um, but I think they were very much kept in certain silos. I think that, the you know, the Europeans were, were very much to, uh, willing to still pursue closer ties with with China and sort of look for better market access for their companies. And then the Russian invasion uh, in February 22 is, was where I would really notice a, a big drop off. Um, you know, from day one, day one, maybe day two, uh, you know, we were in Brussels uh, asking lots of questions at these uh, seemingly endless streams of foreign affairs, uh, foreign, foreign affairs councils, foreign minister meetings, and so on. And and from day one, Borrell, the high representative, was was talking about how we need to have uh, China to condemn Russia. We want China to use its influence to sort of uh, get Russia to end its invasion. You know, and that has has gone on since then. 
Um, and, 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 and whereas China hasn't thrown its hat, its hat like fully into the ring with, with um, Russia in terms of um, systematically arming Russia or anything like that in, in, in Western Europe, not just Western Europe, in the EU with notable exceptions like Hungary, um, it's generally thought that China has sided with Russia. So when uh, yeah, I might ask you about that actually, Finbar. So I think we obviously need to discuss tariffs and economic relations in mm -hmm. a moment, but just this, um, the kind of uh, Russia-Ukraine dynamic that you wrote yourself a few days ago, as we've discussed, um, there was a piece regarding Grant Shapps, the UK's Minister for Defence, who stated that the UK uh, has proof indeed of plans for Russia and China to collaborate more closely on combat equipment yeah. in Ukraine. Are we there already? Is that is that is that happening, do you think? A uh, good question. And you know, so just a bit of uh, uh, just to expand on that story. Um, so Grant Shap said this at the UK Defence mm. Summit, I think that's what it was called anyway, in London mm. last week. So we all scrambled to do our stories. Um, and then actually Jake Sullivan came out later that day and said, well, hang on, actually, we're, we, I need to talk to Grant here and see what he actually is referring to. So there was some ambiguity because actually Shaps had said the US and the UK have got evidence of this. I see some US di diplomats here, maybe <laughs> they've got something to say on that. But um, but so, so it's not entirely clear what he was referring to. I went, obviously, straight to the EAS in Brussels, the EU's Foreign mm. Service, and said, what do you guys think about this? And their general... Well, we need to look at what he's talking about. We're not quite sure what he means. And he had said provision of lethal aid. That was a that was something that right. Shaps said on the stage, which didn't appear in his official remarks that the MOD published afterwards. So there's a little bit of confusion as to whether Shaps misspoke or said something. Maybe he made a mistake, or maybe he said something he wasn't supposed to say publicly. So we don't really know where that stands. But the official position of the European Union is that they notice a huge uptick and intensification of the provision of dual use goods. So things like semiconductors and microchips, they also notice um, quite a, a growing intensity in the terms of like um, Chinese buyers um, trading in goods that have been sanctioned by the EU and funneling them to the Russian military. So you've started to see the EU and the UK and the US adding um, Chinese mm. companies to the sort of blacklist of, of companies who are no longer. as And, and so you, you see that starting very, very small. Mm. Um, you know, these sort of tin pot operators who, are, who have been set up overnight, fly by night Russian operators effectively in Hong Kong and China. What I've been told is that in the next ex sanctions package, there'll be slightly bigger names. And so the EU doesn't really want to go immediately for the jugular, but they will start adding bigger and bigger Chinese firms. So so where it stands exactly, we don't know. Shops is a, would be a good man. <laughs> what did he actually mean about that? I mean, nobody nobody really knows. Did he misspeak? Um, but everybody's watching that incredibly closely. The EU has said it would be a red line in its, its relations with China if they are provi providing actual weapons rather than stuff that can be repurposed or mm -hmm. refitted, drones or whatever like this. Um, so yeah, let's let's see if anything emerges on that. A jumping off point then to talk about China-EU relations, but also China relations with individual member states, something that you also discussed briefly. That it's obviously a whole, there's that kind of dual thing going on of there's EU relations and then member state relations with every part of the world. Mm. And on when it comes to China, I think there's, there's a very clear poll. On the one end, we have the likes of Lithuania, which has testy relations. On the other end, you have the likes of Hungary, which has a slightly kind of cozy relations. A two-part question. Mm -hmm. Can you just comment a little bit on what you were discussing with the war in Ukraine, the extent to which this, this has changed relations between China and specific member states, and anything interesting or anything important? And also just the current state of China-Irish relations, if you can put yeah. any color around that. Yeah. So in the first question, I think most of Central and Eastern Europe have um, it soured the relations. You know, China's relationship with Russia has left a sour taste in the mouth for the Baltics, for the Czechs, the Poles. A lot of these countries who, uh, you know, for, for for whom Russia is a sort of existential security threat. Anyone who's who they see being on the side of Russia is not going to be, you know, very popular. Um, on the other hand, you mentioned Hungary which has sort of used this opportunity um, to double down on ties with, with China. So when Xi Jinping, the Chinese president, was in Europe a few weeks ago, he came to France and he had to face tricky questions from 
Emmanuel Macron and from the European Commission President von der Leyen about, uh, you know, they were right. desperately asking him, please use your influence to rein in Russia, to rein in Vladimir Putin, the same thing that we've been hearing for more than two years now. Oh. He didn't have to hear any of that when he went to Serbia afterwards and then Hungary. Mm. And in the, in fact, in the uh, the Chinese readouts from those meetings, they describe them as like minded partners. Um, they see the world in a similar way. So you have got mm -hmm. a lot of countries in in Europe, not just in Central and Eastern Europe, I think in in Western Europe as well, in in France and Germany, like the the Russia issue has become the top issue. Actually, when when there was a when the former now former recently former. Chinese ambassador to the European Union when he first arrived in Brussels in December 2022. So it would have been, what, nine, ten months after the invasion. I interviewed him, his first interview. And um, halfway through the interview, he said, can you please stop asking me about Russia? Why do you keep asking me about Russia? I'm the Chinese ambassador. I said, well, ambassador, you've been here for three weeks. If you're sick of questions about Russia now, it's going to be a very long time for you. <laughs> As it turned out, it wasn't. He only stayed around for about 18 months. But throughout that time, Russia was really, really rammed down his throat. You know, he didn't, didn't no, no positive agenda. Everything was, why are you not doing more to stop your companies from circumventing sanctions? Why are you not doing more to exert influence mm. on, on, on Putin, etc.? So I think, broadly speaking, it has, of course, soured the, soured the relationship. Um, on Ireland... Um, yeah, I mean Ireland's a bit of a different case in that I think it's it, it, it you know it's my sense of of the Irish Chinese relationship is it's still relatively positive. Um, Ireland generally hitches its wagon to the EU when it comes to China policy. Um, it's not one of those who would rock the boat. As the EU talks about de-risking its relationship with China, the Irish. Um, position you know last week there was a meeting of core pair ambassadors on friday this is something that's going in one of my stories later in the week so you're getting a sneak preview. Yeah. <laughs> um and the, so, so they're talking about things like outbound investment screening export controls and so on and the french are saying we love this we want more of this industrial policy uh mm. add more technologies to the to the list of stuff that we want screened and so on whereas the irish are like mm. please slow down a bit more cautious we're an open economy we don't want this sort of uh what what gives us our sort of special uh status you know as a as a open investment economy to be put in, in in jeopardy so i think ireland is very much among those countries of free traders who would prefer europe remains more open less protectionist um you know i think that there was probably that was probably helps explain why li chang the chinese premier came here in january just as a bit of context, and I, I was talking. I didn't about, want to ask you about this, in fact. So yeah, you. well, uh, and I was. I, I said the same stuff at the Ireland China conference last week. So if if you watched that, then sorry for repeating myself. But Li Chang has only has not left China since that. He went to the World Economic Forum in Switzerland, and then he came to Ireland. So he didn't go for a state visit to Switzerland. He went to the World Economic Forum. He came for a state visit to Ireland. Before that, he'd been at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization in Kyrgyzstan. Mm -hmm. He'd been at the G20 in India, and he'd been at some China ASEAN event in Indonesia. He doesn't leave China very often, and so for him to only in the last year have visited China as uh, sorry Ireland as the, as a separate shows that they actually. My guess would be that they realise okay, Ireland is an open economy that will lobby for open markets in Europe. We need to maybe remind them that we're working with friends. Um, so that's how that's how I see the Irish position. I don't think it's terribly uh dramatic that feels terribly dramatically about the EU China relationship in the way that you Lithuania or mm. Hungary or Germany, which has an awful lot of uh, you know, exports and and at stake. But I think that's how China views Ireland. Interesting. And just to keep it parochial for one further question, yeah. the um <laughs> <It's> about Fermanagh. <laughs> For the people of Fermanagh and the people of these <laughs> islands, does that of, of this island rather, does that create what you just described there, Ireland as you know the the most open economy in the EU and China identifying it as such? Does that create more opportunities or more vulnerabilities for Ireland? Do you think? It depends. It depends on who where you're sitting. Mm. You know, one one person's economic security is another person's economic coercion and all that. So, one person's openness is another person's vulnerability. It depends on your ideology and your political thinking, but. I mean, I think that it's clear um, that Ireland probably won't be able to be a bystander forever. 
Uh, if you look at the export profile of Ireland to China, chips, number one, mm -hmm. two billion in chips in the first four months of this year went from uh China from Ireland to China rather. Uh most of those are Intel. The US is kicking up a storm about uh legacy chips and China's building up capacity there. What happens if China uh, the US rather decides that China Ireland can no longer export those to China? Um you've seen with ASML, the big Dutch um, semiconductor equipment making uh, firm in the Netherlands. Once the US decides you can't do that, you just can't do it. Mm -hmm. It's like the long arm of the US dollar. It's not not a discussion. And uh, by the way, Intel is a US company as well. So the second biggest export is um, vaccinations. Wuxi, farm, farm, the pharma, big Chinese pharma company is set up in Louth, is also in the crosshairs of US regulators. Awesome. So as nice as it would be for Ireland to be able to sit back and say, let Let's watch them, you know, the superpower rivalry evolve. Nobody really is immune from it because it's, you know, the nature of what has made Ireland wealthy and, and successful, globalization, open markets, is something that's in question now. And if you've been open to investment from, from, from uh, you know, the Chinese companies that are prominent in Ireland, Huawei, TikTok, you know, those are also in the crosshairs of the regulators. So. Yeah. It's not something that Ireland can can ignore forever, nor do I think that they're ignoring it. But I don't, you know, they, I hope they're coming up with a plan for this. Yes, yeah, sir. At least discussing. I mean, what what do you do if that happens? I mean, that's that's a significant amount of capital taken out of the economy. Most certainly, and that may come up in the in the Q and A. I expect. Uh, just to be clear, we're talking about semiconductors when you talk about chips as opposed to not potatoes. Sports, just, no. yeah, yeah. Just, just you know, just yeah. for my own knowledge, I was going to uh, just make a quick quick point and maybe one or two themes then. This feels part of a wider discussion about Ireland that's been ongoing for maybe the past seven, eight years, where Ireland has, hasn't has really had to articulate a, a clear foreign policy, actually, ever, given the position we have between the EU and the US, and between the US withdrawal, the UK withdrawal, instability in Ukraine, the war in Gaza. We now kind of see Ireland articulating our kind of, and also the um, the growth of DFA, the amount of kind of embassies yeah. that have been opening around the world. It's really interesting, and this is part of that discussion, I feel. As you say, Ireland having to kind of ultimately not pick a side but take a position I guess. no i think m most um i mean look, i mean i think most of the eu would you know it, it, you know europe is an ally of america that's clear right you know it's not you know picking sides yeah is not really the the question but it's about you know how long are you going to be able to remain as open as you have been um mm -hmm. is it a choice you know the agency is removed the moment the United States decides Intel can't export those certain chips, you know that's just one mm -hmm. one element. But of course, Ireland has agency to change its own policies to try and to try and rectify that or try and try and diversify. Yeah, I mean, I hope they're scratching their heads about it. And this is a perfect segue to what I think it'll be my last or my penultimate question before turning to the audience, and then I I do have more stuff to keep us going. I could do this all morning, Finbar. But just talking about tariffs, and I think you've written as trade war brews in the EU, which is an interesting, it's a nice verb, but it's I don't good. write the headlines. <laughs> but yeah, I stand by that one. Good. And that you say the EU is scrambling with China, or sorry, EU scrambles to gauge uh, what China retaliation lies ahead. So this is with respect to increasing kind of tariffs and uh, saber rattling from the United States uh, with respect to Chinese exports or Chinese imports into the US. Well, no, this is, uh, I would say, more to do with what's happening next week, which is the EU will uh, finish its investigation into subsidies in the Chinese electric vehicle sector. So the US has gone hell for leather and slapped a 100% tariff on the import of uh, Chinese EVs to the United States. But the, China doesn't export many EVs to the United States. It's already got quite a high tariff. A lot of them are coming to Europe. Next week, the European Commission will... Uh, notify exporters um, uh, of the level of duty they intend to apply because of whatever level of subsidies they have discovered in the in you know these Chinese exporters, uh, which they say are distorting the, the potentially distorting the single market. Mm -hmm. um, so you know um, it'll come. The, the decision will be made next week. At which point it'll be uh internally communicated to the exporters at which point, point we hope they will leak us to leak it to us journalists <laughs> um and they have a month to appeal etc um but we're all keeping an eye on what will be the chinese reaction the retaliation if they were being sort of smart about this they wouldn't do anything because um the eu market is already very open to chinese evs and i'm not expecting a, a, a my guess would be something in and around the 20 percent 
mark in terms of the duty applied to Chinese mm. EVs, which actually still makes it a, a, a commercially viable option rather than the 100% in, yeah. in the United States. If China retaliates very strongly, it, it, it risks sort of, uh, you know, adding to this downward spiral that we've already discussed. Mm. Um, but of course, the Chinese government, through its various media channels and through its spokespeople and so on, have threatened to retaliate on uh, pork. On uh, They've opened an anti-dumping investigation into French cognac. Um, so the, the key is always go for the farmers because... Um, they uh, make a lot of noise. Mobilizing. They drive their tractors to Brussels and spray excrement all over the walls, and they generally get their way. So this is what you see happening right now. Uh, you know, this sort of like we're going for the emotional issues. Ten years ago, when there was an EU-China uh, dispute over solar, the reaction was to put tariffs on French wine. So, of course, the vin vin vineyards of Bordeaux were waving oh, yeah. their pitchforks. And, uh, you know, so, so so we're looking out for stuff like that. And actually, in the Ireland, Irish sense, it'd be quite interesting because um, lots of European countries have had their access to China's beef and pork markets reopened in the last couple of years. Ireland had been closed off due of to the BSE case. So it'd be interesting to see Chinese retaliation is not always like, uh, so they describe it sometimes as asymmetric, where maybe they push the buttons with another member state in order to get them to lobby more intensely against um you know, the, the action that's been taken. So, for instance, the German car manufacturers really don't like um, the idea of tariffs on Chinese made in EVs because they think that their companies are vulnerable to retaliation in uh, in China. Mm. But, you know, the Spanish farmers haven't said anything about this, but maybe their prawn products get brought, uh, dragged into this in order that Spain kicks off at the council and sort of opposes the permanent imposition of tariffs. So... You know, we'll see. It could get quite complicated. The dynamics can be can be quite difficult to mm. parse. But yeah, let's let's see where that where that one goes. You'd written, and I'm I'm coming to the audience now. After this, you'd written about uh, the potential consequences of what you've just described on the U.S. election and on a couple of the the swing states there. Yeah. Can you describe the potential kind of um, impact for the voters in November from what we've described here about tariffs and EVs? Yeah. Well, that was one guy. Simon Evanet, who's a trade professor in Geneva or Saint 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 Gallen, Saint Saint Gallen yeah, who, who uh, uh, read his work for a long time, and he he basically was looking at you know so all these uh, high tech um, stuff that's been um, tariffed or put on, put under tariff by the Biden administration. He was looking at the electoral map, uh, where were the swing states, and which of those swing states were most exposed to the Chinese economy, and wouldn't that be a smart place for the Chinese to um, perhaps yeah. target for retaliation because it would mean that voters there then would, you know, turn their back on Biden. I would add a caveat to that, though. Mm -hmm. I don't think that would be very smart because I think the Chinese probably want Donald Trump in the White House. So if you do that, then you're turning more voters against Biden and then you get Trump. Um, you know, if you follow mm -hmm. the the sort of the, the, the political calculus to the to the logical conclusion, I think the Chinese would prefer Trump because he will not work with allies. Um, he will burn his bridges with Europe, probably, most probably. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he he's chaotic. And, you know, people may think that perhaps they don't like the unpredictability of Trump, but they can deal with that if it means that this Western alliance that the United States has been trying to construct to, to go against China is is weakened. So the, it's the thing that I think is often underappreciated about the Irish economic um, transformation since the 80s that we, we hear often from captains of industry who come here. It's actually sure it's the English speaking educated workforce. It's the low corporation tax, but it's also the stability, like the relatively boring nature of the Irish tax code and yeah. Irish politics in general. So yeah, stability is, is a great value to the yeah. Chinese and everyone else, I'm sure.